Welcome to this, this talk on humility and vice and virtue. Um, what we're going to do here is go through a number of different philosophical and, and somewhat, in some cases, theological approaches to humility. So I've got some handouts that I provided you with, not on every single person that we're going to study because I decided today it's better not overwhelm them with too many handouts. Four is already quite a lot. Um, I know many of you, those who don't know me, I'm, I'm Gregory Sadler. I'm a philosophy professor. Um, I'm also the president of an educational consulting company called Reason.io, and I'm a philosophical counselor. Um, and I've been interested in this issue of humility in part because of three of the people that we're, we're looking at here. That's David Hume and Aristotle and St. Anselm, all of whom I've done some work on. Aristotle and Anselm and Hume. But they all um, view it in very different ways. And so, as I'm trying to make sense of it, I wanted to, to do a talk where I do some, some comparative work because I thought other people might find it interesting at all, as well because it's not only you know, something of pure intellectual interest, but it has to do with our, our lives, the questions about pride and humility and their relations with each other. So what I was planning is the, the lecture portion will last about 45 minutes, um, maybe a little bit longer if we, if we do a lot of back and forth discussion and question, which by the way, I encourage if there's a, you know, at any point there's questions or something like that, uh, don't worry about digressions. Uh, that's the way, those of you who have been at my talks, you know that that's the way they usually go. So when I say lecture, I don't mean just strictly me <coughs> at the podium just talking at you. Um, what I'm going to do is give an overview of the topic itself and distinguish a few connected issues that often get blurred together. And then a little bit of history of ideas because humility um, changes its face over the course of the history of ideas in ways that certain other virtues and vices haven't kind of done. And then um, I'd, I'd like to look at these six views on humility and its opposites. Um, I made a bit of a change in, in what I put out there originally. I was going to talk about this guy Friedrich Nietzsche, but I thought, um, well, we've already got two people in the modern period. It would be nice to have two people in the ancient period. And Epictetus the Stoic works very well for this, this sort of thing as a counterpose to Aristotle, so I, I put him in there instead. Um, so we're going to look at two ancient philosophers that are pretty representative of, of the ancient attitudes about pride and humility. And then we'll look at two um, medieval, you can call them philosophers in a very broad sense, or theologians, they're actually both monks. Um, and then we'll look at two early modern figures, or really mid-modern figures, uh, David Hume, and Mary Wollstonecraft, each of them have to say something about it. So with um, these connected issues that I, I said they were, they were often blurred together, um, it's, it's good to distinguish them from each other. And I don't, I don't mean that you have to like resolve each one separately, but the people that we're going to look at are sometimes you know, jumping from one to the next to the next, and it's useful for us to try to pull them apart when we're looking at it so we can, we can keep it straight. Um, one of the issues from the start is, you know, well, what is humility? Um, does everybody have the same definition, or oftentimes we don't have definitions for very important things, the same way of characterizing it? As it turns out, these people don't. They're going to they're gonna differ on that to some degree, so I'll try to point out where they differ. Um, there's a whole vocabulary involved which sometimes requires a little bit of creative translation to, to bridge the gaps between them. As we're going to see, for example, Mary Wollstonecraft is going to say, humility, that's bad. Uh, modesty, that's good. But she only does that in the chapter of her Vindication of the Rights of Women, where she's actually talking about modesty. In later chapters, she inconsistently then uses the word humility to mean what she calls modesty. You know, And so it's, it's good to keep track of that sort of thing. So you can, you know, is she talking about this at this point or this at this point? Um, another issue, what should humility be distinguished from? You know, is there just one opposite to humility, or perhaps several different opposites? Um, how do we make that, that distinction? Uh, what, are, what are some states, this is a very important thing, that are like humility, close enough to it in certain respects that they can be facsimiles, or, uh, you know, 
pass off uh, counterfeits of humility, but not quite the same thing as humility. We're going to see some attentiveness to that. Um, another issue that we can talk about then is how should we view humility and these opposites in terms of moral evaluation. It, you know, it's one thing to say what humility is. It's another thing to say, well, is it a good thing or not? Should we, should we be humble? Maybe we shouldn't. Some of these people are going to say uh, that humility is not a good thing. So we want to take that into account as well. Um, then there's another issue that we really can't get away from. Humility and pride are interrelational um, states, or, or if they're virtues or vices, they're interrelational virtues or vices. I have humility or pride not all by myself um, in some room, you know, isolated from the rest of the world. Like I could have temperance that way, you know, if they put a whole array of food in front of me, do I gobble it up, or do I take smaller, you know, portions over time? I can, I can have temperance by myself. You can't have humility or pride totally in isolation. It's, it's something that has to do with social roles and our, our fabric of relationships. So that, that's another interesting thing. And we could think about this question, is humility just a function of social pressure and inequality, which is a big question for the ancient thinkers that we're going to look at. Now, there's a, I, I wanted to use an example or really a host of examples that all fit onto, uh, wonder, under one class to drive this, 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 uh, this home that we, we can make distinctions. How many of you have heard of a humble brag? Yeah. Just a few? Humble okay. pie. Well, humble pie is, uh, th isn't that what you have to eat after you like? Yeah. That's like eating crow, right? Yeah, humble right. pie is filled with crow, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> um, or who knows what else, you know, other bitter that's things. Not, that's not the same as humble brag. No, a humble brag, this is a, a fairly new thing. And I haven't done a lot of research. There's actually a book about it that, that recently came out, which is called Humble Brag, The Art of False Modesty by Harry Whittles. And he looked at Twitter. Um, Twitter forces people to, you know, write in these very short, is it 140 character? Yeah. yeah. Little, little blasts. Um, so it's not like a Facebook post where you can write at length. I mean, if you write too long, people will read it. But if, if Twitter, if you write too long, it'll say, you can't send this. And a lot of people on Twitter use it to, you know, kind of connect with the, 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 the rest of the people in, in their world. And social media is interesting because you can see how people interact with each other, and there's a record of it, right? Unlike our day-to-day -day ordinary interactions, these people are talking to each other, and you can. There's actually an app that will let you like chart out a whole conversation and turn it into a storyboard. <clears throat> so this guy, um, I don't think he's the one who coined the phrase. People started using it. A humble brag is when you seem to be speaking in a humble manner, self-deprecating. I don't want to make too much of myself, but you're really sneaking something in there that's very prideful that's elevating you, that's showing that, you know, only you could have said this thing. So I've got three examples here. Um, one, and I don't remember who actually said these because I didn't mark that, but here's, here's a great example. I just stepped on gum. Who spits gum on a red carpet? <laughs> so, no, you know, what's, what's the, I mean, it's not really that humble, but um, I suppose, you know, getting gum stuck on your shoe, that's no fun. But, you know, not everybody gets to walk on a red carpet, right? So. It's a way of sort of sneaking it in. Um, here's, a, here's another good one. Totally walked down the wrong escalator at the airport from the flashes of the cameras. Go me. So it's like, <laughs> see how klutzy I am when, when, you know, I can't see because people want to take my picture so much. Uh, you know, it's, you see where this is going. And here's, here's another great one uh, that Andy will particularly appreciate because uh, of the culinary connection. OMG, I hate watching Top Chef when I'm on it. I never know if I'll come out like a schmuck. <laughs> so, and then the answer is yes, you do. <laughs> um, but, you know, I mean, look at, th that's not humble at all, is it? And, and so we could, we could say, you know, well, what's going on here? Are these people deliberately taking on the guise of humility so that they can be prideful? Um, how should we feel about this? Should we say, ah, oh, you know, harmless? Or should we say, well, there's something really wrong with that. That's a sign of, of bad character. These are important questions that we can ask, but we need 
some perspective from which we can ask it. And that's what these, these different philosophers and, um, and theologians can provide us. So I, going to the history of ideas thing now, I, I said that um, humility has had changing fortunes. I didn't use exactly those words, but I should have. Uh, it's had changing fortunes over the course of history. Um, if you look at a lot of ancient cultures, it's not, it's not particularly highly valued. There is a sense, um, if you look at ancient Greek tragedy and epic, that you know the gods, they're up there and don't get too cocky, you know, no matter how wealthy you are or powerful, because they might, you know, they might take some action against you. They can be envious of you, so you better watch it. Uh, in the ancient Babylonian, uh, you know, creation story, the Enuma Elish, human beings are created as servants of the gods, so that the gods won't have to be servants of each other. There's a higher class above you. But, you know, within that, that, that human, <coughs> you can be as prideful as you want for a lot of as a matter of fact, it's actually encouraged as a good thing, and being humble is a sign that you just don't have what it takes to compete. You know, I mean, think about the Greeks in the Olympic Games. Um, you, you know, you, you go to the, the games and you don't, you don't, you know, like put on your second best face or something like that. You get out there and the, uh, what's the one where it was like no holds barred? There was, there was some boxing stuff, and then there's the one of these beat the living hell out of each other. Um, Pancratia. Um, you know, we can imagine these guys being sort of like the WWF wrestlers, where they, they have this big persona and shout. And kings were like that too. You know, you, you look at the, um, the uh, Iliad and you see these, these people clashing with each other. Um, the Iliad only tells the stories of the big guys. There's a few little guys in there, but they're just big players. And the idea is, well, if you're, if you're not a big guy, you don't get the story told about you because you don't deserve a story. Uh, you want a story? Do something big. You know, take some power. And so pride is not seen as an unequivocally bad thing. It's bad if you can't back it up. It's bad if you can't make good on your boasts. But it is good to, be, to have a very strong sense of self and to be assertive. Um, now that's going to change um, as we move into, as antiquity gets more complicated. And Epictetus is a good example of somebody who takes a different position on this. And there's, there's really uh, a lot of tensions running through ancient culture. As a matter of fact, it's a bit of a mistake to say there's one single ancient viewpoint that we can, we can uh, point at because, you know, we don't have the stories of an awful lot of people or the perspectives of them expressed. Uh, when we look at Aristotle, for example, Aristotle takes for granted that we're, we're talking about a slave society. And slaves, um, they're, they're tools with, with souls. They're better than um, the technology at the time because you can tell them what to do and they can you know, apply their brains to figuring it out. But you don't really care about their social status. And you don't listen to what they have to say unless they you know, happen to be you know, causing trouble. And then, you know, then you take take heed of it. That's a pretty common attitude in, in ancient, um, ancient uh, cultures. Now, <clears throat> when, when Christianity gradually pervades um, the culture in the West, and I'm using West in a pretty broad sense to go all the way to like, you know, what's nowadays Iran, um, it's bringing a whole new set of, of valuations of things to bear. Some of this is coming from Judaism. In Judaism, you have the same emphasis on don't get too uppity with respect to, you know, the, the guy upstairs, uh, or with, for the Greeks, the guys and, and girls upstairs, but um, there's more to it. There's this, there's this sense that humility is something that should be cultivated. It's not as fully developed as you see in, in you know, the New Testament uh, or in early Christian practices, but there is a, a different kind of emphasis there. With Christianity, we see that there's a, a lot of discourses where they talk about the pride of the pagans. And remember too, Christianity took about 400 years to filter into Roman culture. It was not an official religion for a very long time. Uh, it coexisted alongside of, of all sorts of you know, um, uh, mystery religions 
and a whole other church, the Manichaean Church, that you can read Augustine and find out about that, uh, and, and a lot of pagan rites and, and old rituals and, and structures. And these guys talk back and forth to each other. And one of the things that the Christians pointed out was that they understood the value of humility, that, that pagans didn't get this. And we see this become more and more and more stressed um, in, in what we now call the, the Middle Ages. Now there's, there's one important influence that we're going to look at on early Christian culture and then running throughout all the way to about the high Middle Ages, which is monasticism. And with the monks, it, all this stuff is, you might say, intensified. Um, monk comes from the word monikos, which means alone. The, the early monks would go out to the desert to be alone or other barren places. Uh, in, interestingly, in, in Western Europe, the monks were the ones who often trans, uh, um, uh, transformed the wasteland into habitable uh, civilization uh, over time. So it didn't quite serve its purpose of being you know, out there isolated. It was too successful at what it, what it did. Um, but with, the, with monasticism, there's a really clear central emphasis on humility. But now one of the things that we can say about Christian culture is just like ancient culture, there is no one single thing that dominates every case um, even talking about you know the Christianization of Europe, Europe was never fully Christianized in any any complete sense. It was always sort of a, a you know a struggle going on. One of the guys who we're, we're looking at here, Saint Anselm, by the way, it's his feast day today, um, so it's kind of nice that we're, we're talking about him. He's a, a great example because um, you know if you read his letters, he's constantly having to tell these monks, you know, quit behaving like pagans. You know, quit acting, quit acting like somebody for whom the gospel doesn't matter. Um, and he's telling this to people that he knows are, are, are Christians and are supposed to be doing it. He has to fight with the, the English king who wants to take all these church lands. He, he spends most of his time in exile as, as Archbishop of Canterbury. Um, and, you know, there's, so when we talk about Christian Europe, it's not as if the age of faith meant that everybody was completely pious, as a matter of fact, he even talks about the struggles in monastic orders between those who were sort of um, given as, as children to the monastic order, which was common practice at the time, and those who, like him, later on, decided, hey, I want to become a monk, and they quit being what they, what they were. In his case, a scholar, in a lot of cases, like in the case of his abbot, an old soldier. And he said, they're almost always at each other's throats in monasteries. So, you know, when, when he's talking about this, don't, you know, don't think that he's uh, imagining that everybody is like this. But everybody should, in, in, in his view, try to strive towards that. Um, now, in, when we move to the modern period, we're talking about a lot of really radical transformations of intellectual life and society. Um, in the religious sphere, you know, we can talk about the Reformation. And, you know, one of the things that... Monasticism brought a lot of good things. One of the, the, the bad tendencies that it, it, it often brought with it was this idea that, you know, the laity can just let the monks do their business, do all the praying. There was actually a division in one of Anselm's works. There's those who, who farm, those who protect, and those who pray. And the ones who pray, that's their job. They're praying for everybody else. So these other guys don't have to be so concerned about their, their you know, development or spiritual life or anything like that. Protestant Reformation, one of the good points about it was, um, you know, people like Luther saying, you know, the, the laity need to be just as concerned with, you know, what the, the religion is supposed to be promising them as do the, the clergy or the monks. Um, born with it went a lot of bad stuff. You know, Henry VIII used the Reformation as a pretext to just wholesale pillage monasteries and, and give the funds to other people, uh, his, his court favorite. So yeah, there's some, you know, with any historical thing, some good and some bad. But on, on the whole, you can say that we can, we can think of a democratization of spiritual life going on with the, the Reformation. Um, and even the Counter-Reformation, or the, now it's, we don't call it, we call it the Catholic Reformation, um, even that, um, tended to, to have a bit more 
um, participation, you could say. Um, the Renaissance, which precedes the, the Reformation, and, you know, a, re a rediscovery of ancient texts and ancient ways of thinking about things, which include thinking about pride and humility. You know, rereading Aristotle's texts and thinking, well, maybe it's a good idea to be a proud guy, to be great soul. Maybe these monks are, you know, misguided. Um, the rise of the bourgeoisie as a dominant class. That's another major transformation that's going to have important effects on how we look at pride and humility. Um, in, in a way, both Hume and uh, Wollstonecraft are representatives of the bourgeoisie. Hume a bit more like the, the landed gentry, you know, uh, not so much the mercantilist uh, class. Wollstonecraft very clearly uh, advocates, you know, rising bourgeois values. Um, there's other things that we can talk about as well, but those are the, the those are the things that happen in the modern period that are particularly relevant for how people rethink humility. So we can talk about three different periods uh, and three different approaches to that. And then you might say, well, well, you know, how do we fit in? We're, you know, most people say we're in a new period, but nobody exactly uh, knows what to call it. You know, post-modernity, late modernity. Um, you know, uh, it's, 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 you know, there's a lot of debate back and forth. And we can think about how this applies to our own position. Can we draw on the best parts of these these ideas, and then maybe you know leave the the, the slag and the detritus behind? Um, and, but, you know, that's, that's an open question that we have to do a lot to approach. So let's look at Aristotle. Before I, I, I go, I've already talked quite a bit. Any, any questions or comments at, at this time? Yeah. I sort, of like, I sort of like the idea of there being a group of people who will pray for the rest of us. <laughs> I do too because I'm lazy. I'm sure that's not, I'm sure that's not why you do it. It sounds like you're working on yeah, I mean, if, if prayer works, then um, you know you want to get as many prayers as possible, right? And so you could. You know. I don't know people praying for all different things, but if you have somebody, yeah. you know, a group of people who are just dedicated to, um, you know, praying for good things for everybody, wouldn't that be neat? Yeah, well, there and there are. I mean, that's what does go on at monasteries, and not just Christian monasteries, but you know, in Buddhist monasteries and. And Hindu orders as well. So and, I, can give, I can give it up. I <laughs> yeah. Excuse me for interjecting. <laughs> sure. And I, I believe our Congress has prayer breakfast regularly. Ah, oh, see. See, so we're doing really good. <laughs> yeah, but I, I don't know. You're I mean, not praying. Pray. <laughs> 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 there's, there's somebody there to do the prayers. <laughs> Doesn't seem to have an awful lot of effect. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I think that a lot of the, this discussion about pride and, and humility uh, has really to do with excess. So, you know, Aristotle, of course, was, he was really all for it, but no way, right? Well, we're going to see not quite so. When it comes well, to not quite so. Okay, but anyway, I am. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> Aristotle be damned. Uh, in any event, uh, what I'm really trying to say is that uh, uh, that. Uh, one can take either, either pride or humility to extreme. Oh. Probably not good. No. So, that, so you know, I could be so puffed up, you know, and all that. Yeah. You know, people would say, well, we keep, don't go in here. You know, don't talk to him. <laughs> or, on the other hand, my humility might be, might, might get begun to be turned inward, become self destructive because yes. I begin to, uh, you know, degrade the image that I have of myself to the point. Uh, we're paralyzed. Yeah. And, so know, that's that's the way Wollstonecraft is going to look at it. Uh, when we when we get to her, she's going to say, modesty lies in between pride and humility. Mm. Well, um, that's probably my view of it. Yeah, I mean Aristotle's kind of connects with that, as, as we'll see in a minute. But um, his is a little bit more complicated, and it does stress the being the big man. Kind of thing. Uh, any other questions or? We're going on to Aristotle. Yes. Please. So Aristotle is kind of a, a good representative figure because you know you're right. He he usually is uh, advocating a nice middle position. And why does he have to ad advocate a middle position? Because there's usually people at, at other extremes. You know, the, the culture itself is full of people who are 
vain or proud and those who are um, not you know, assertive enough. And so, like I put it out though, he's, he's not really talking about the whole of the society and we have to take what he's saying um, with, with that in mind. You know, he's, he's not saying anything that could be useful for somebody who's stuck in the position of the slave. Um, he's, he's talking to people who are essentially property owners, um, the, the class of the masters. And he tends to identify and describe virtues by contrast to two vices. So when we talk about the, the mean, it's the mean between two extremes. Not everybody does this when it comes to virtues and vices, but that is <coughs> his um, approach. The virtue that's relevant here is what we call in English, and I always mispronounce this, uh, magnanimity. Uh, I got at that time. I trip over that word a lot. Um, I like the word great soldness better, in, in part because it's easier to, to <laughs> say. Um, but it's also closer. You know, the mag magnanimity is coming from the Latin magna magnanimitas, which is just a, a, um, a you know translation straight from the Greek into the Latin. You know, great soldness. They both they all mean the same thing. And by great soulness, um, it doesn't. It's not like you know having a great soul in the sense of like being super healthy or um, being a beautiful person, but rather being the kind of person who does big things, who takes on big projects, who thinks highly of themselves. And you notice that he he places it in between two vices, and the vices one is of excess, too much; one is of uh, deficiency. And so the one with uh, excess he calls vanity, or you know, uh, we can think of other things like being uh, presumptuous. And this person thinks very highly of themselves. The trouble is, they think more highly of themselves than they actually deserve. And so they claim more for themselves than they should, and they thereby make themselves obnoxious to everybody else around them. This would be the person who, you know, just to take one example, you tell a story, they've always got a better story than you, you know? and uh, it just reminds them of that, you know. That's, that's probably a main person. Now, if their story actually, I suppose, if their story was actually reflective of their life and there's no puffery involved at all, then maybe they could be a great soul, but in most cases they're not. <clears throat> and the people who are, are likely to do this, like he says, are those who lack virtue but are in the upper class by birth. The rich, the powerful, in our day I put on here, celebrities would fit into that. Uh, there's, there's something that comes along with having advantages that makes people start to think, yeah, this is me, I deserve these advantages, this is, this is the core of who I am. And then what often happens, like, like I put here, is they attempt noble projects or actions or undertakings but these are beyond their capacities, and then they fail. And then things, Aristotle doesn't talk about this, but you know what it's like. Then things really get sticky, because they have to make sure that nobody knows that they failed, or it's somebody else's fault. So you've got to watch out for these, these kind of people. The, um, the vice of deficiency is undue humility. He calls it small souledness. Um, and this is the person who actually does deserve good things, but doesn't claim them because they think less of themselves than they should. And they undervalue themselves. They're not interested in honors. And, and Aristotle says, in a way, they lack self-knowledge. They don't realize who they are. They, um, neither does, of course, the, the vain person. The vain person thinks there's somebody bigger than they are. This person thinks there's somebody smaller. Um, they, they're, because of this, they hold themselves back from good projects, things that would actually be appropriate to them. So this is the person who, when the promotion comes and the boss says, come on in my office, I've got something I want to talk with you about, we want to give you some more responsibilities. You know, um, I think that you, you could be a good person for this leadership role. They're the person who says, oh, I don't know. Yeah, that, I, that's probably not my, my sort of thing. Um, I'd rather just stick, stick it out here in the cubicle. I kind of like it there. Um, and you know, that's fine if, if they actually do belong in the cubicle. But if they have these, you know, qualities that the boss hopefully isn't, you know, just making up, um, it would be good for them to, to take on the projects. They don't, and so that's that's that other vice, which is uh, not a very obnoxious, but you know, not good for them. So does part of small soulness incorporate um, like a lack of discernment? 
Is it that they're unable to see their value and therefore act accordingly, or is it that they're they're aware that there's a value and they choose to reject the value? They're aware of a value in themselves, but they choose to reject the value that's in themselves. You mean? Yeah, like what the the example you gave of the cubicle person, yeah. right? It's that they are aware that they're capable of more. They're like, yeah, no, I don't think so. It's it's well, you know, it's interesting that you, you framed it like that because I didn't think. When I'm framing an example, I don't think of somebody who actually does know that they're, that part of why they're saying, you know, I don't think so is because they don't think themselves up to the task. They're trying to get out of it. But could there, could there be cases where somebody's like deliberately self-effacing? I guess that would be a false humility maybe then. Yeah. And that's, that's. Maybe a different. Yeah. That, that, would, that would be a different modality. Aristotle doesn't talk about that because that probably wasn't much of a problem back in his time. And this shows how different cultures are. You know, um, when he talks about anger, he doesn't talk about passive aggressiveness, which is something common in our society, um, because I guess he didn't think it was a real issue. He talked about some other things in very clear detail. Um, what was the other thing that you asked, though? There was another. Well, I asked if it incorporated a lack of discernment. Oh, discernment, yeah. So, you know, you could have somebody, how do people end up being small souls? A lot of the time it's because they've gotten messages from other people, you're no good, you know, or um, a lot of times it's, it's connected with class or with, with race or with gender, you know, you're not up to that sort of thing. That's for, for those people, um, you know, only, only they get these opportunities, you know, you don't want to, be, you don't want to stand out. Um, and so you can hear these sort of messages and you can you can you know say ah that I, i'm i'm going to rebel against that mary wollstonecraft is a great example of, of somebody who did rebel against that she exemplifies her theory to a t um, she became a professional woman when that was like practically impossible um, except to be a professional woman in the, the you know the lady of the night kind of sense um, <laughs> she was she was a uh, um, a writer she was one of the first women in the modern period to make her living as a writer. Um, but she, you know, she was an unusual character. Many of us, when we hear these messages, we internalize them and we start to believe that sort of thing. And I think that Aristotle would, would say that maybe that, that comes from. That, that turns into that kind of disposition, yeah. Is Aristotle only talking about men? Oh, that's a good question. Practically speaking, yes. Uh, he, uh, he says a lot of, of really boneheaded things about women. Um, I actually have a piece I'm working on called the Aristotle's Woman Problem. Um, but, I mean, here's the good news. The stuff that Aristotle, where if you strip away that stuff, where, you know, given Aristotle's um, um, approach to things, if you were to bring him into a typical undergraduate classroom and seat him down, and you know, have them watch the discussion that's taking place and see that you know, oftentimes the female students are contributing a lot more than the male students, which is a big problem in our time. Uh, and then take them out to the bar and say, uh, well, what do you think? Uh, still still going to say that women are like inferior versions of men? He, he probably would say, well, the empirical evidence is you know, showing me that that's not the case. So part of it is because of his culture. And the stuff that's good in his work is pretty much equally applicable. To, to men and to women. I think that this, this notion of vanity and great soulness and uh, undue humility could, could work, whether you're a, a man or a woman. In our culture, I mean, we know that this is the case, um, like in the classroom, until the, the most recent generation, girls were pretty much discouraged from talking, you know? Um, a lot more calling on boys who raised their hands. This is pretty well documented. There's been a radical shift to the other extreme now, and now it's hard to get the male students involved enough, and we're losing quite a few of them. Um, dropout rates are much higher for male students than for female students, unfortunately. But, you know, this, yeah, this stuff would clearly apply to, to both, both, uh, both genders. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, there's a term that's popped into my head, which is what I would call the Carl Sagan humility, okay? Okay. And by that I mean, it's a different kind of humility than what we've been talking about so far, I think. Yeah. And it's the humility that comes from working very, very hard 
to understand the nature of things. Ah, yeah. And, and what you would call the humility of experts. You know? Perhaps, but it's not just any experts. Yeah. It's the people who are really worried about the nature of nature. You ask um, a lot of experts who are like really great in the field <clears throat> questions that an intermediate person might have a really quick answer to. And the expert often looks bad because they say, well, it's complicated, and I don't want to you know, commit to an absolute answer at this point. Uh, let me take a look at the stuff. It's going to take me a while to give the answer. But that's because they know that things are complicated, and they're smart enough right. <laughs> to, not right. to give an off-the-cuff answer. You know? Well, you know, it's interesting because there was a particular individual that I knew when I worked at IBM yeah. who was probably the very best engineer I ever knew. Wow. Okay. And I worked with him, and he once said to me, he said, an expert, and he was referring to himself, <laughs> is, a, is a person who knows all the things that don't work. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a, a form of humility, I think. Yeah. Because what he's really saying is, but I don't know what could be done. Yeah, and, and experts, real experts, quite often, they've got nothing to prove to anybody. Um, this is actually, this will be a total digression, but um, it's, it's kind of a good example for this sort of thing. And I'm thinking about music, because one of the things that uh, Andy and I like to do is to go to see uh, bands that we would have liked to have seen in our teens and sometimes did and are now seeing much later. And a lot of these bands are guys in their 60s and 70s. But they get up on stage and they play and they do a great job. And the shows are very different than they used to be. Because none of these guys have anything to prove to anybody. They're, in a certain way, they're at the top of the game right now. Even though physically, some of them have to like, you know, shuffle, instead of like jumping around the stage and stuff like that. Um, some of them actually are still pretty spry, believe it or not, in their 70s. But that sense of like, hey, I don't have anything to prove to them. I know this. That you're right, there's a certain humility that can go with that. Let me talk a little bit more about the great soul ones, though, because the great soul person exemplifies some of that. They don't care about what most people think, they care about what the people who matter think. And they can seem a little bit haughty or condescending, but if they're genuinely great soul, the Aristotle says, they're not going to be that way to the little people. They'll be that way to the people at the middle level or towards their, their rivals. Um, and they, you know, they, like it says, they think themselves worthy of good things because they actually are worthy of good things and they claim those good things for themselves. They don't claim every single good thing for themselves. They're less interested in financial matters and more interested in things that are more substantive, things that are going to be more lasting. They're not so interested in small honors, like who's going to sit where. They're more interested in who the plenary speaker is going to be, all those sorts of distinctions. Now, Aristotle also distinguishes a fourth state, <clears throat> which is closer to what many of us mean by humility, what some of these other guys are going to mean by it. This is the person who deserves little and correspondingly claims little. And Aristotle doesn't place that in the spectrum. He says, well, what should, what should we make of this? And he's only got a few lines. He says, um, they're clearly not great souls because they're not claiming anything big for themselves. But they're clearly not a bad person either, like these other schmucks, the, the vain person or the, the overly humble person. Uh, they're actually doing what reason suggests. It's just that reason says, hey, you're, you're not that big of a, a deal. You know, um, you know it, it's kind of nice sometimes to have, to have students who have that sort of attitude because they're much more teachable than students who come in and um, you know, think that they already know everything, right? And then that's what allows you to actually develop and become something. You know what this is the biggest problem for, by the way, when I talk with other professors? Art students. Because art students, often here in high school, because they are, you know, with respect to like high school level, very talented. You should go into art. Look at how great your stuff is. Then they get to college, and their instructors are, or their, their professors are like, okay, you're taking this drawing class. And they're like, oh, I already did drawing. You know, I think something like this probably happens with some culinary students too, right? Yeah. Um, they're like, well, I've, I've been cooking for a long time. I don't need to learn technique to subordinate myself to technique. Those are the students who won't progress. Because in a certain way, they're, they're, they're proud. 
Um, it's the students who say, yeah, I'm, I'm, I really don't know anything. Uh, can you teach me? But well, you can actually teach something too. So that's probably enough about Aristotle. Let's, let's look at Epictetus. Quick question. Yeah. How do you think, too, in a way that the people who feel that they don't necessarily deserve that much and are content to take not that much are, in many ways, the people who make great things possible? Because if everyone was trying oh. to be Odysseus, right, <laughs> if we wouldn't have that, right? Yeah. He needs the folks who are content to just sort of march in and lay yeah, yeah. down their lives and be the soldier in a way. I mean, first off, most of us can't be Odysseus, so we'd be miserable failures at it. Right. right? And there's certain fields in which, yeah, you can't have Odysseus without having a whole bunch of oarsmen and companions to go along with them. Um, so if you want to have something along those lines, yeah, you need some, uh, hopefully they're not just cannon fodder. They yeah. turn out to all be cannon fodder in the Iliad and, and Odyssey, unfortunately. Yeah. Like, but You also need the, you know, waiting for 20 years at home. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> not just waiting, but actively making sure that these suitors can't marry her by doing these complicated strategies and <laughs> trying to not get her son killed. And yeah, yeah, um, that's true. And and Penelope has like an entire. She's at the apex of a pyramid of an entire staff of servants that get things done. And yeah, there's a lot of great things that I mean. I'm more receptive to the notion that, that great things that get accomplished are the work of many people. You know, Aristotle, he's mostly interested in who's the, who's the guy at the top, or, or the, the woman at the top who's done things. With Epictetus, we have a bit of a shift. And this is because Epictetus is a Stoic. I, I've given you this handout that's about what's, what's in our power and what's not in our power. Um, just a very th really quick thumbnail sketch about Stoicism. They were a major uh, philosophical school that, that pervaded Hellenistic, that is, you know, Greek and Roman culture. Um, and they were kind of like an alternative for a lot of people uh, who, would, who would, you might say, drop out to some degree of the normal course of culture and adopt a more rigorous, ascetic kind of lifestyle. That, was, that still didn't require them to, you know, be monks and go off you know, somewhere else, but where they would say no to a lot of things. And they would say no to a lot of things in part to preserve their own freedom. So Stoics are not big partiers, uh, not just because they don't like being hung over, but because you know if you're going out and drinking all the time, um, you're putting you're, you're using your freedom to sort of throw your freedom away. It, it, it has effects on your character. Um, a lot of temptations in, in ancient Roman society about you know power. Stoics would exercise power, but not for its own sake. Um, one of the things that Epictetus um, talks about that all Stoics did was what's in our power and what's not in our power. Or you could translate it even more literally as what's your business, what's not your business. You know, uh, the Greek is epi is, is uh, epimon and uh, epimon, which just means on us, on you know, like towards us or on top of us, and not towards us. So you notice that a lot of things that are not in our power are things that people often get very worked up about and think matter an awful lot. Like um, houses and clothing. And um, they didn't have you know, cars back then, but they had, uh, they had means of transportation, horses and chariots and stuff like that. Reputation, um, getting invitations to dinner parties, very popular activity back then. You know, that's how you knew that you were in with people, going to dinner parties. Um, your body as well. <clears throat> you know, Epictetus didn't think that you know you should not do anything with your body. You should exercise, but you know you don't control that much about your body. You can forestall a couple things, but you can't stop it from aging, and um, you can't you know. Well, now you can change your gender uh, in certain ways, but back then you couldn't. And I mean, you can dye your hair, but you know you, you got the hair that you're that you're stuck with at that time. You know, if you want to dye it red, that was a very popular thing for the Romans, or blonde, you probably have to poison yourself, you know, using lead or stuff like that. Um, you, don't, you don't really control these things. And these things, in a certain sense, are less you than what you do have control over. What, what is it? Well, your ruling faculty, your, what he calls prohiresis, which means your faculty of choice. The, the thing that is, is what 
you know, the, the product of the choices that you've made over time that keeps you making the same kind of choices. So if somebody's a jerk, they're a jerky pro racist. If somebody's, you know, really attentive to other people, they have an attentive pro racist. They have made themselves into that by their choices. Uh, we have choices, and we have decisions, and we have commitments, and we have freedom to choose with those sorts of things. Not, you know, to, to choose to be, you know, things to be totally beyond the realm of possibility. I can't choose to be um, Bill Gates, right? That's, there was already a Bill Gates. Um, and it's not going to happen where I'm like Bill Gates either. You know, that's not in the realm of my possibility. But, you know, can I be a good professor or a bad professor? That's up to me. Totally up to me. You know, according to Epictetus. Um, our opinions and our judgments. A lot of people say, ah, I just have an opinion. I don't, you know, that's just the way I see things. Epictetus says, no, you get to choose how you see things. You're responsible for it. All this other stuff, you know, that, that's outside of us, that can seem to necessitate our opinions and our judgments, but that's because we choose to allow it to do so. Um, and, you know, we can go on through, through all sorts of other things. What's the upshot about this? Think about what this would mean for pride and humility. Um, are any of these things that many people actually do take pride in worth being proud about? Not for a Stoic. If you're good looking, that's just what happened to, to be the case. You know, um, nothing to be proud about. Were you born into a good family? That's nice for you. Nothing to be proud about, though. Um, it, it's not even something to be humble about either for a Stoic. It just doesn't matter. It's in the realm of what they call the adia for uh, doesn't make a difference. Quite, quite literally. Now, it's interesting, if you think about this, a stoic would be a lot more humble in the senses that we ordinarily think of it than an Aristotelian would, wouldn't they? Because they're not going to get into it about, you know, honor or position or who's inviting who to a dinner party or stuff like that. <coughs> Epictetus actually says, you know, there's a price for everything. You decide whether you pay the price. You want to, you, don't, you know, you're upset because somebody doesn't invite you to the dinner party? Well, he doesn't say it quite in these words, but you didn't kiss their butt. So, you know, if you want to get invited, you need to do that. You know, decide whether that matters to you. Um, if you have this sort of point of view, you're probably going to live a more humble life. Interesting. The Stoics were often accused of great pride. Why do you think that is the case? Yeah? Well, because they set themselves apart from other people who were more controlled by their passions yeah. and whatever. So they were they were high and mighty because they could had probably had more self-control. Yeah. Now some of the Stoics could be a little preachy. <laughs> right? and, and there's actually a great um, author, Lucian Sam Sosta, who, um, he's a comic writer, and he has a, quite a few of his, his uh, comedies where you'll have like a, an Aristotelian and a Stoic and a Platonist, and they all go to the dinner party and they all behave like complete jerks, you know. But the Stoic behaves in a jerky way that like contradicts Stoicism, you know, uh, the, the Cynic in a, in a way that contradicts that. Um, and there probably were a lot of guys like that. You know, anytime there's a philosophy, there's the people who really live it out. I think about Buddhism. You know, how many people uh, claim to be Buddhists and, and you know, you, or he's an even better example that has been used in comedy routines, um, yoga studios, right? And the whole philosophy that goes with yoga and saying namaste, and then watch what happens in the parking lot. <laughs> right? That's when you can tell whether it's really sticking or not. <laughs> Epictetus, he really did live it out. He, he walked the walk. Or, no, he walked the talk, right? Um, and so did many other Stoics, too. One of the things to think about, though, is doesn't this, you know, why should you extricate yourself apart from the, the world, which is kind of an, an entrapment? Because you're better than the world. So, Epictetus actually says, um, there's a bit of God within you. And you're acting, you know, the fool with that bit of God. Why don't you, you know, actually act like God? So maybe there is a bit of pride <laughs> in the so. Stoic position. Let's look now at these medievals. So it's got John Cassian. I don't have a handout for him. He's a really important monastic writer. Yeah. Uh, 
Could you um, allude to how the Epicureans fit into this uh, dinner party? Oh, you know, so Epicurus. This is interesting because when we hear the word Epicurean, we usually think like some, you know, glutton who just gobbles everything up and wants the best of everything, which is totally the opposite of what Epicurus, in his writings at least, um, advocates. And it appears, you know, to be the opposite of what he in his real life did. There were already those slanders at the time about Epicurus and his school. Um, in these comedy things, the, Epicure the Epicureans do act like the sort of vulgar notion of Epicureans. You know, they're like they're the ones who are like you know, stealing the ham and putting it under their shirt. Or <laughs> like yeah, nice. um, yeah, yeah. Well, it seems to me that list that you give here of people, you know, if you feel that all of this is within your power, yeah, surely you think you're hot shit. <laughs> <laughs> You know, I mean, it, it, it could be the, the case that you actually are, you know? Uh, that's, that's, that's the question, you know? Um, well, let's, so let's go on with Cassian. So Cassian, yeah, he's an interesting figure. He is a Westerner who decides to go to the East to study monasticism. And he brings one of his buddies along with him, and it takes him decades. Um, first, he starts out in Palestine. And he goes around to all these monastic communities and talks to the abbots and you know sees what what's what and lives with them for a while. Then he then he says, I gotta get really serious. I'm going into the Egyptian desert because they have the reputation for being real monastics. <laughs> and he leaves us a couple works. The two most important ones are his conferences, where he's he's you know recalling conversations that he had with these uh, monastic fathers, and then his institutes, which is sort of a you know compedium, his his own original contribution. And this turns out to be extremely important for Western monasticism. Uh, in the rule of St. Benedict, Cassian is one of the authors who Benedict recommends monks ought to read if they want to understand monasticism, if they want to understand the point of it. And Cassian is also really important. If you heard of the seven deadly sins, Cassian is one of the people who is important in the development of that idea. In his case, it's the eight uh, principal vices. They're going to become the seven deadly sins through a transformation that these monks are carrying out. Another Benedictine, Gregory the Great, is going to change the list into seven. He's going to tweak them a little bit, too. Cassian is getting this idea from Evagrius Ponticus, whose thought has uh, sort of pervaded these monastic communities. And he framed it in terms of thoughts that oppress us, sort of like demons that are tempting us. So these are things like gluttony, or lust, or... Uh, the Greeks had this word Acadia, which means like a restlessness, you know, not being able to stick to topic. Um, gets rolled into sloth later on. Uh, sadness, you know, sort of a depression. Wrath. Um, then there's two other ones, vainglory and pride. And Cassian, when he's discussing these, he's not only saying that these are vices, so they're, they're, they're opposed to virtues, the virtue that they're actually opposed to is humility, but they're the worst of vices. So, you know, this is a real transformation here. You know, with, with Aristotle, if you're going to say, what's the worst vice? He'd probably say something like, I don't know, you know, cowardice, or, um, you know, intemperance, maybe, or injustice, probably, would be a good one. But Cassian says, no, no, it's pride. Pride is the worst. And this reflects a very different attitude. Um, now, vainglory is connected with pride, and one of the things that he says that here that's really interesting, which shows you how realistic he was about monastic life, vainglory often uses humility as a cover for itself. Look how humble I am. <laughs> you know? I can be more humble than you. Uh, there's all sorts of permutations on this. And the monks were just as bad as, as ordinary people about this. He says that Pride is the worst and most problematic of the vices, that it's last in the order of spiritual struggle, but it's actually first in, in what we might call metaphysical terms. It's the origin of, of all the, the sins and faults and vices. It's destructive not only of the, the virtue, which is humility, that's opposed to it, but of all the virtues. Anything good in us, pride destroys. Vainglory, on the other hand, takes anything good in us and turns it into a reason why we can vaunt it over other people. 
So, you know, with, with gluttony, for example, gluttony is actually, gluttony and lust, those are minor things. You've got to get control, the monks say. First, you've got to fast so you can get control of your body and then, you know, work on lust. But those are kind of, you know, penny ante stuff compared to the spiritual uh, things. Um, and, you know, if you're a glutton, you know, you know you're a glutton. You eat too much. You can't control your, your appetite. You know, continence would, would or, you know, self-control would, would replace that. Um, if you're lustful, eh, you know, you're pretty good idea about what that is. You're not going to, you know, think that you're actually a chaste person when you're not. Um, and if you're going to be lustful, well, then you can't be chaste. And if you want to be chaste, then you can't be lustful. So we'll pick one or the other. But, you know, if you're lustful, that doesn't have anything to do with whether you control your appetite for food or whether you fly off the handle and get angry at people and have, you know, you've cultivated. You can be lustful and a patient person at the same time. They're, they're moving in different vectors. But vainglory takes any one of these virtues that we've developed and then says, see how good I am? That's a big temptation for, for monks, he says. Pride erodes those virtues, turns them into something that's, you know, a dark facsimile of them. So, for Cassian, genuine humility, how is it going to work? It requires a relationship with God and other people. And there's sort of concomitant uh, virtues that go along with it, like patience, love, kindness, obedience. He sets a really high standard for what counts as humility, uh, so it might not be very useful for us. He says that you have to give everything up of your own. You might get some of it back, but you have to give up everything of your own. Just divest yourself entirely. Um, who's the model there? Christ, with his emptying, his, his taking on humility in order to, to combat the, uh, the pride of the devil. We go into Anselm. Now we're actually jumping ahead like uh, be about 700 years. What was the date of your former? Oh, Cassian? Cassian. Fourth century. He would be a contemporary of um, St. Augustine. They're both, both about the same time. Um, matter of fact, they get involved in some of the same theological controversies when Cassian comes back to the West. Um, now, Anselm was a Benedictine monk. Of course, like most monks, he didn't start out a monk. Um, he, he, uh, he wandered around. He wanted to be a student. He actually signed up at that monastery because the prior... Uh, was a very famous scholar. He figured, I'll study with this guy, but, but it stuck. He found something that you know, really worked for him there. And he eventually becomes an abbot and a bishop. Um, his bishop years are really the worst years of his life. He's always, he's always much more happy without positions of authority. And he doesn't work out his ideas in terms of the seven deadly sins. He's unusual in that respect. He does, however, talk an awful lot about pride and humility. And the handout that I, I've given you is part of that. He says that all sins, you know, really have their origin in pride, and humility is the, the remedy for that. But then the question you got to ask is, great, what does it mean to be humble? And in his um, De Similitudinibus, which is a work that was very popular in the Middle Ages, still not translated, by the way, um, unlike most of his other works, um, in that, he... He has, he has a lot of discussions about pride and humility, and he gives us this, this notion or this metaphor of a mountain that we climb. There is a valley of pride in, in which we don't really know ourselves, and the, the um, you know, wild beasts come and attack us. Those are the vices. If we're prideful, we open ourselves up to all the vices coming and latching on to us, um, and we, we don't know who, who we are. And, you know, the, like he says, the more that we're raised up by pride, the more that we're exalting ourselves, the lower we sink. So humility is, in a certain way, like lowering yourself. But Anselm thinks of it as an ascension. He's not the first person to come up with this idea, by the way. Benedict has, has a ladder of humility. Um, Johannes Climacus has, has a divine ladder. Um, but Anselm has this seven-stage thing. So if, if you look at that, he... Um, starts out with this notion of knowing oneself to be contemptible. Now, by that, he doesn't mean that, oh, you know, woe is me, I'm just, I'm just garbage or anything like that. He means like a, a really hard, 
clear look at who you are and you know deciding whether you really are, as you put it, you know, hot, hot shit. shit, yeah. Uh, and the answer is no, in most cases, right? And even the things that we think are really you know, great about ourselves, um, those are pretty temporary, and they didn't come from us in most cases anyway, so we probably shouldn't be too proud of it. So when he's saying contemptible, he doesn't mean just like everyone should spit on you or things like that, but something more... Um, Knowing you know, your own ignorance? Would you say? Well, that's part of it, yeah. I mean, you know, that, that's, that's helpful to, to, to know how little you can know. That'll, that'll keep you in check a bit. Um, now, notice, he says, you can actually know that you're contemptible, but um, not be upset about it. Mm -hmm. It's better to actually be upset about it, because now you're taking it seriously, right? That's the second step. And then um, you can just keep it to yourself and not tell anyone else about it. Or you can confess to others that you're not as great as you've been putting yourself out there as being. That's to be more humble. And then, you know, you can, you can uh, do that and people can say, oh, no, no, we, we, we think you're great. Uh, and then you can insist and say, no, actually, this is the case. I am not the person you think that I am. I'm not the person I put myself out there as being. Um, that's the, the fourth stage. Then we get to the stuff that's really tough. Step five, accepting others speaking of oneself as contemptible. Letting them say what they're going to say. Now you're, you know, that takes a lot of, of work. Um, step six, accepting being treated as contemptible by others. And this means putting up with stuff that's wrong for the sake of, you know, the other person's growth or for the sake of God. You know, there, there are going to be a lot of cases where other proud people are, you know, treating you as contemptible because they treat everybody as contemptible. And you, you know, if you're if you're following this, you you say that's that's fine. You know, it'll sort itself out. I don't need to insist on my own self worth in this case. Yeah. This may just be me imposing my own will on Anselm or trying to. <laughs> but I don't like. I mean, I don't like. But I don't. I don't understand step six and seven because to love to love being treated yeah. right as contemptible. I'm waiting for like step five a where it says one changes one's behavior from contemptible to this other well, sort of behavior. Anselm seems to think that as a human being, and Cassian thinks this too. Cassian actually says, um, as opposed to like a lot of other earlier virtue ethicists who'd say, yeah, one person can have all the virtues. For Aristotle, the, the great souled man got all the virtues. That's why he's such great stuff. Cassian says, that ain't going to happen with human beings. But he, one human being can have one or two virtues well developed. Uh, that's why we need a whole community of people who have virtues and can rely on each other. Anselm seems to think that no matter how much you develop yourself, you're never going to be really great stuff. But to uh, love he, being oh, so so to love. It doesn't mean in a pathological way, like you know, being a masochist. It means you know when we talk about like self-giving love, putting up with another person's nonsense, you know, that Christian agape notions, loving the, even the people who are unlovable. It's that sort of love that he's talking about there. That's love. Well, there's a lot of different there's a lot of different um, types of love. Yeah, but that's that, that's one that, that I mean, that's like. Let them all step all over you. Yeah, again, it's not that. philosophy. It's again, it's not that. It's not masochism. It's uh, it's the sort of love that he would say Christ showed in you know putting up with some of the nonsense that he put up with. But how can you contribute to society if you allow those? Well, you might pick and choose where you do it. What's that? You might pick and choose where you do it. It's not that he actually let everybody walk all over him in every case at all times. Remember, this is a guy who said no to the king of England, and well, that could get you killed. But uh, he didn't do it on his own account. He did it, you know, when it was needed for social purposes, you know. So can we think about the, the loving to be, you know, of being treated as contemptible as um, an acceptance and a compassion and a yeah. Sort of yeah, I mean, you know, when you think about why, why do people treat us badly, and the same thing goes for the Stoics, by the way. Um, one of the responses that we can have is like, who are you to do that to me? And that's, 
from this perspective, that's to say, look, I matter. Don't do that to me. And that may be the position that, that we do want to take. Aristotle would say, right on. That's exactly what you should, you should say. Um, but having compassion for them, or the Stoics would say pity, it's the same term, really, like Aleos. Um, that's, you know, that's another possible response. And, and you have, you know, you have pity for them as being so screwed up that they, you know, this is what they choose to do. That's how they choose to behave towards you. That's, that's what Anselm thinks humility involves. And he, by the way, he doesn't think a lot of people are like this, you know, especially the monks. You start out on the premise that, that you are contemptible. Yeah. That's interesting. That, I mean, that, that, that's uh, like the original sin. Well, uh, no. I was different. Well, original sin is a doctrine that uh, yeah. humankind are all stained by. It. But it's, yeah, don't you think this this suggests that human beings are contemptible? Yeah, but I mean, yeah, Anselm would be willing to say that that could even go for Adam, who hadn't yet fallen, or something like that. If you wanted that humility. So yeah. So Adam would feel he was contemptible. Again, when I, when he's saying contemptible. We have to be careful about thinking about what he means by it. It doesn't yeah, mean like everybody should spit on him. that word. Does he mean deeply imperfect? Yeah, I mean, we all are imperfect. Well, that's we know that Adam was imperfect, you know, in the that's story. That's what go for. Yeah. 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 Contemptible, so to contempt means to say, look, this isn't any good. This is something bad. You know, to criticize. We're, we're all criticizing. There's, there's, there's parts of us that we could say, and when you criticize, you're not just saying, look, this is a flaw, you're saying, this is a flaw, and I don't really like that you've got this flaw. You know? yeah. But it's the differentiation between, I have a flaw that makes me contemptible, or I have several flaws that I am contemptible in these ways, yeah. but I also possess, maybe in other ways, a goodness. It's oh, not yeah. a He's not saying that there's no goodness yeah. at all. Yeah. As a matter of fact, this is part, to be able to say, I'm not as good as I as I claim to be is being better than than you know claiming that you're you're something you're not. Yeah. Well, then it's a kind of false humility. Which is? This is. No, no. This is actually a true humility because you'd be saying, "Look, I am this." Yeah. Anselm mm -hmm. says yes. that humility is yeah. genuine self-knowledge. Uh -huh. So if, if if what he means by um, humility were just false humility, then that would be possible. Now, I mean, we can reject his point of view. Okay. I just don't want us to distort his point of view no. so that we can reject it. Let's be really clear about what we're, what we're uh, either accepting or rejecting. But by saying that you There's a great illustration of this in an episode of Friends. So oh. <laughs> the three women in Friends. Yeah. Um, Phoebe is sort of the flaky one. Um, tells the other two something about each other. So. Phoebe says to Rachel that Monica is high maintenance and demanding. And she says she to is. Monica that Rachel is a pushover. So Monica and Rachel compare notes and spend the entire episode trying to disprove how demanding and pushover they are, succeeding in only proving that they are exactly, that she was exactly accurate in her description of that. And eventually they get frustrated in this project, and so they gang up together and they go to Phoebe and they say, well, you're a flake. And Phoebe's response is, yeah, I know. Um, and, um, and so it just seems like that is like this thing, right? Like, she's not saying, I'm horrible, I have yeah. nothing to offer, but they're like, well, you're a flake. She's like, yeah, I am. And like, that, okay, um, you can call me that, it's true. And the two of them have these actual character traits that you yeah. can see demonstrated, but they can't bear to have those pointed out. And yeah, that, this need to not know. have flaws or not acknowledge yeah. flaws. Yeah. That, are, that are going to be with us. I mean, we can get rid of some of our flaws, you know, but we're never going to get rid of all of them, you know, unfortunately. But, yeah. It's interesting that we're coming around to talking about self-knowledge. Yeah. Because, uh, you know, well, the Gospel in the Nagamani Library, uh, whose name I forget. You think about the Gospel of Thomas? Yeah. Yeah. One of the first things it says in there is that, the, you know, the <coughs> path the road to salvation or Jesus or whatever you want to say is self-knowledge. If you don't yeah. know yourself, forget it. You're wasting your time. Yeah, there's plenty of There's all sorts of um, so traditions out there. That, yeah, so that's I mean, interesting. It, 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 a lot of the stuff that, that Anselm is saying, too, by the way, 
So, well, so you know, really, 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 humility is really an outgrowth of just being honest with yourself. Yeah, well, it, it has to be, it's like a practice. It has to be done over and over again because it's so easy to, um, to uh, forget. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's easy to forget. And then it's easy to like focus on this one and so you can ignore the other flaws over here. You know? Well, I think humility helps bring on compassion. Yeah. Because if you, if you, if you, if you're yeah. humble about yourself, well, you know now you can't go stepping on everybody else because right. they, you know, yeah. you're not, there, there is no perfection. There's that, and it frees you up, too. If you don't have to invest so much time and energy maintaining a facade that's um, just, you know, it's really not worth maintaining, you have that energy that you can give to other people. You have, you have time, you, um, you're not threatened, you can engage with them in a compassionate way, you know. If you, if you, are, if you are humble and um, uncertain, yeah. it becomes more difficult to pick up an AK-47 and go out and start shooting people. Maybe. I mean, you could, you could also be humble and who am I to question the orders of my superiors, you know. Yeah. Oh, that's a different kind sometimes, of humble. But sometimes some humbleness creates anger. I think, I think that it's anger in the person who has it? or anger? Well, I, 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 a feeling, I guess, you know, um, seeing sort of angry that you're not better. Oh, yeah. You understand? And then, yeah. and then letting yourself blame everything else out there uh, for your... For, for you, you know, it's, it's inadequacies. In, it's interesting. John Cassian uh, takes a, a, like a zero tolerance position on anger. He says the only time that a person should be angry, and he's like at an extreme on this, is at themselves for their own vices. Every other occasion is bad. It's a vice. Um, but it's okay to get angry at yourself. Epictetus actually goes further than that. And he says, the foolish person blames other people. The person who's making progress blames himself. And the person who's actually, you know, an expert, who's proficient, doesn't blame anybody. Yeah. So let's go on with David Hume. So as we move into the modern era, now we're going to, like, turn things on their head. Um, some of the things that you guys have been, you know, concerned with, with, with you know, the, the monastic views on this, uh, David Hume kind of exemplifies. I don't have a handout for him either. Now, I picked him in part because he's got this passage where he bashes the monkish virtues. Um, he says that they're really types of vice. So humility, in, in you know, the way that the monks are doing it, is really a vice. He's, in the inquiry regarding human morals, he says, celibacy, fasting, penance, mortification, self-denial, humility, silence, solitude, these all serve no manner of purpose Neither advance a man's fortune in the world nor render him a more valuable member of society. Neither qualify him for the entertainment of company nor increase his power of self-enjoyment. We observe, on the contrary, they cross all these desirable ends. They stupefy the understanding. They harden the heart. They obscure the fancy and sour the temper. And so he's, he's saying, like these monks, you know, uh, they, they're not really nice people to hang around with. And people who act like you know, the Puritans, for example. In, in England, they didn't have any monks left by that time, in most places. But they had plenty of, uh, they had plenty of um, pretty dour Presbyterians <laughs> in, in Scotland, where Hume was, where he also didn't get a university position because he was, uh, he was an atheist. Uh, although they, they didn't actually know it at the time, they just suspected it of him. Um, but, you know, there, there was a, a strong sense of, um, on his part, that the this, this self denial and sort of self abasement it's really not good for a person and he talks about pride and humility not only in terms of virtues and vices but also in terms of basic uh, you could call them emotional uh, responses to things that um, you know govern the way that, that we act and he, he says that they're, they're like love and hatred which are also very basic responses that we feel. But they, they're different in that they have an orientation towards themselves. So whatever I, I you know, feel pleasure in and it's somehow connected to myself, I feel pride. When I feel uh, pain or uneasiness or you know, uh, sadness about in myself, um, that, that's, uh, that, that involves humility. 
And so he says, you know, think, think about a house. If I own a house, that's connected to me. And the house is, in a certain sense, you know, a reflection of me. So if it's a, a beautiful house, you get to feel proud about it. The beauty, which is not in me, but in the house, is still something that's giving me a sense of self-worth and pleasure. And then, you know, an ugly house or a ramshackle house or maybe a house that's very untidy, I feel humility in, in that case. And pride and humility involve comparison. They can be in all sorts of things, you know. He talks about people doing it in, in, in you know, with their dogs. My dog is better than your dog. You know, I have a dog. You don't have a dog. You know, um, oh, I don't have a dog. I feel I feel left out. You know, that sort of thing. But um, reputation, power, bodily attributes. You know, being good looking, being in shape. Uh, Hume was not either one of those, by the way. If you look at his, his portrait, he was actually um, rather corpulent. And uh, there's a story told. I don't know if it's actually true that he actually proposed to a princess at one time and got down on bended knee. Couldn't get up. <laughs> um, yeah, he had a gout pretty bad later on. Um, they can also extend to children and friends. You know, our, our children and friends can make us feel proud, or they can make us feel feel humiliated. In a certain sense, when Hume is talking about people being humble, I think you should actually probably substitute the word humiliated in there, and it would make more sense in his his 18th century English. Now, there's a weird uh, dynamic involved here. Um, when we feel proud, we feel good, Hume says. And it actually like primes us to do things. So, so feeling proud can actually make you do things that then can make you feel more proud. Um, it emboldens you. Humility, on the other hand, we, we sort of retreat into ourselves. We feel bad. We don't take things on. And um, more, you know, people more want to feel proud than, than humble. But how do we feel about other people's pride and humility? That's an interesting thing. It feels good for me to be proud, but does it feel good to you when I dominate the conversation? Because I, you know, I'm such, you know, big stuff. How does that feel? That's so good, right? So other people's pride affects us negatively, unless we're able to participate in their pride somehow. You know, if we're able to identify with them, what you call sympathy. Which means we sort of take on, where there's like an emotional contagion, we take on their ideas. Same thing with humility. We like other people's humility. It makes us feel good, actually. You know, when the waiter is, is you know, coming over and they're very deferential to us instead of being brusque and, and snappy, you know, it's part of what we pay for going into the restaurant. It's what some people go into restaurants for, so they can lord it over the server. Um, so, in a certain sense, the other people feeling bad makes us feel good. Hume says. Unless, of course, we participate in their feeling bad, you know, because we identify with them or we sympathize. Or, then, then, of course, we feel bad. But somebody else can be looking in from the outside and still feel good about that. So it's, there's an interplay here that's kind of interesting. Um, pride is, is good for the person who's feeling it, but it's not good per se. And humility is bad for the person who's feeling it, but it makes people easier to get along with. I think that's excessive pride. I mean, oh, you, yeah. I mean, that's what you don't like about people. But if, you, if somebody's proud of what they've done and they're not flaunting it and they're not, yeah. you know, uh, <laughs> you know, I'd say, then you can you could you could feel good for them. Yes, so, so they that, were yeah, that they actually gets proud the, of them. They should be. They that's the advice he gets. Actually, mm -hmm. you you sort of replicated it. Mm -hmm. He says, um, be proud of yourself because it feels good and it'll help you do stuff. And you know, if, if there's anything to be proud about, good for you. Um, just kind of keep it low key. Don't don't let it get too excessive, because then you're going to get on other people's nerves, and they're not going to like that, and you're going to be a less you know functional member of society. I mean, he doesn't use these words, but you know. So he's he's advocating something almost exactly like what you're talking about here. But you shouldn't be humble in in the monkish sense, you know. First off, if you do that sort of thing, you're never going to get ahead in business, <laughs> right? Hume is a bourgeois. Um, you're never going to make anything of yourself. It's, you know, it does not advance a man's fortune in the world, nor render him a more valuable member of society. 
you're not going to be any fun in company because you know we kind of like the the jockeying that's involved. We don't like somebody who's too you know oh whatever you want you know. We want somebody who's got some uh, how do we put it you know like they got some character. They, they stand up for themselves. Um, it's not you know when 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 we're arguing the point you know then then they should sit down. <laughs> um, so Hume is expressing something very very different, isn't it? Than these these monks. Yeah. I'm surprised, you know, I, I haven't read anything like this in Hume. I'm surprised he's sort of how to, telling people how to behave. Is well, that what all the philosophers were doing? Uh, they often have books where they, they do. It's, it's what ethics is. How to win friends and influence people? Oh, no, that would be more like rhetoric. Oh. That's, but ethics is, is, you know, about right and wrong, good and bad. Usually trying to make some sort of reason case for, he doesn't just say, do this, do this. He gives you long paragraphs of his um, analyses and explanations. Uh, okay. Oftentimes they also say why the other philosophers are wrong. Yeah. You know? <laughs> Some philosophers are not very humble in doing so. <laughs> you want to hear a funny story about that, that's, yeah. that sort of thing? So there's a guy who I like quite a bit called Schopenhauer, uh, Arthur Schopenhauer. And he, um, he was a uh, 19th century philosopher, and he is, is uh, in that German idealism whole spectrum. And another guy who I also very much like, um, Georg Hegel, was um, a very popular lecturer. As a matter of fact, Hegel brought Schopenhauer in. He recommended Schopenhauer. And they're at the same university. Now, in the universities at that time, you were paid by the student. So you are paid to be popular. You would give lectures. And it was really a really easy job. You didn't have to do any grading, or meeting with students. You just, just get up and you'd have, you'd have your lectures written. And you didn't have to even field any questions if you didn't want to. You would just read the lecture. You know, and the students would take notes and discuss things with each other. So Hegel was wildly popular. Um, he, was, he was big stuff at that time. And Schopenhauer decided that Hegel was not the proper interpreter of Kant. He'd really screwed up Kant's system. Schopenhauer was a faithful disciple of Kant. And, you know, the, he does have a point because if you were going to look at their works, Schopenhauer is a more faithful, he is doing something original of his own, but he is more faithful to Kant than, than Hegel is. So what he did is he looked at the time that Hegel had his class scheduled, and he scheduled his class at exactly the same time. What, what do you think he had in mind? Why would he do that? Exactly. He was, was going to draw all of Hegel's students away, so everyone would see him for the fraud he is. And he only had two or three people show up to his class. And so that was a long semester. <laughs> um, he had the last laugh because uh, Hegel died of cholera, and Schopenhauer got out of town and escaped the cholera epidemic and lived on a rather bitter man for quite some, some time. But, you know, that's a good example of, like, uh, overconfidence, you know. He, he should not have tried to take on Hegel. Uh, it was totally unrealistic to do so. But he thought that this would actually work. And, you know, this is sometimes how we have to learn. Too much bad, so. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to Wollstonecraft. She is actually um, a, a, a person who's not much written about, unfortunately. She, she straddles a lot of very interesting fields. She's talked about by feminists, but they often, you know, talk about her sort of like you talk about the, you know, the beginners, and we, we want to talk about our stuff over here. She's kind of an embarrassment to them in certain respects because she's bourgeois and she insists on, on, you know, gender equality and that women and men really should be doing the same thing, um, virtues and vices, same across the board, you know. But she was actually revolutionary in her time for saying that. Um, she writes a Vindication of the Rights of Women, uh, after writing a Vindication of the Rights of Man and writing a few other pretty interesting texts, but the Vindication of the Rights of Woman is, is her, her major work. She lived a rather bohemian lifestyle. Um, she was an unwed mother at one point. Um, we find out about this because her husband writes a biography of her after she dies, uh, uh, Godwin. Um, and that, that soils her reputation. So for a long time, people won't take seriously her, her writings. But she was really a brilliant mind. And one of the things that she talks about in that book 
is uh, modesty. She wants to say modesty should not be understood, understood as what she calls a sexual virtue, meaning it's something that just applies to women. You know, it gets pushed as, you know, women should be modest. And what does that mean? Oh, you know, the mirror, don't talk, uh, don't get involved in this. Um, then you can say, well, she's not going to put up with that because she's clearly not that, that sort. Uh, but she makes a good case for modesty properly under understood, being a virtue that applies equally to men and women. So here's how she, she figures it. She says, humility is, is actually bad. Humility is a kind of self-abasement that leads a person to think less of themselves than they should. So this is sort of like a rejection of the monkish version too, right? Uh, pride or, or vanity, on the other hand, is when people think too highly of themselves, more highly than they ought to. And a modest person is somebody who thinks rightly of himself. So it's sort of like with Aristotle and the great soul man. If you really do have all the stuff, you think highly of yourself because you do. But if you're really, uh, you don't have that much, but a little bit, you think of yourself as that, that fourth class, you know, and you, you don't think you deserve a lot, but you do take what you do deserve, right? There's, there's this proper assessment that's, that's in the middle. And she points out that a modest person is going to take on big projects. Again, it sounds a lot like, like Aristotle. No big surprise, she's, she's influenced by Aristotle. So she uses as examples John Milton and George Washington. She says, you know, Milton, you know, we might think of him as being proud, but he was actually modest. He had the talent to pull off what he did, so he did it. If he was humble, he wouldn't have tried it. He wouldn't have written these great texts. George Washington, when he was offered uh, uh, command, remember too, George Washington, she knew this, had been a commander before, you know, he'd served in the French and Indian War, sort of worked his way up, you know. It wasn't like his first job when they said, hey, you're in charge of the Continental Army. Um, he, if, he was, if he was humble, he would have said, no, no, no. Maybe let Benedict Arnold do it. Benedict Arnold was, <laughs> Benedict Arnold was a great general, you know. That's one reason why he betrayed the, the, the United States. He wasn't getting the recognition he thought he deserved and the, the command posts. Um, if they'd given him command, he probably would have won the war quicker um, than, than Washington. Because Washington was good, but not, not great. Um, military, military historians you know, are pretty clear about that. Um, but, you know, they, they, they were modest men. They weren't proud. Um, so she also gives you examples of biblical characters. Peter is vain. Why is Peter vain? Why, what are some examples of what he does? Oh, you know, I'm not going to deny you. Uh, you can't pull it through, can you? Uh, what else did Peter do? I mean, there's a couple no, of places. No, no, you can't wash my feet. Yeah. <laughs> I wash my whole body. No. <laughs> yeah. no, just your feet. <laughs> there's, there's a couple of places where Jesus has to say, you know, sort of like, what the hell is wrong with you? You know? <laughs> he always goes a little bit too far, doesn't he? Now, uh, Moses, uh, Wollstonecraft, interestingly, says, was humble. Why would, why would Moses be humble? Well, you know, if we think about when he's given this commission, he says, you know, wait a second, you're going to send me to the, the Egyptians and the, the Hebrews? Oh, who's going to listen to me? You know, I, I don't have the facility of speaking. And God, you know, sorts this stuff out for him. And Moses, you know, he had the choice. He said, ah, let somebody else do it. But, but he, you know, he has to do it. Because um, God, you know, knows, knows Moses' capacity. And, and she says Jesus Christ was modest. Um, he, you know, he attempted and then did great things, but he also didn't, you know, make a big show of himself. Except maybe, you know, with the, the on the donkey going in, but you know, that, even that, he could, he could have ridden in on a, on a war horse, right? But he's he's doing things in a more low key way. She also does talk about the difference between modesty and bashfulness. This is interesting too. So when people are modest, they're behaving in such a way that's coming from their character, that shows that they know what their true value is. Bashful people sometimes behave in a modest way, in a way that looks like modesty, but it's just because they're ignorant. They don't, they don't know any better. And as soon as that ignorance goes away, they become really impudent. So somebody who get, first gets hired, and they seem like a really nice person, and they're not, you know, mouthing off to anybody yet, that's just because they don't know yet who they, get, they, they can mouth off to. And, you know, give them a month, and pretty soon they're going to be insufferable. 
Um, she talks about this in, in terms of uh, the, the prostitutes um, coming from the countryside and being very demure, and then you know figuring out what's what, and then becoming very bold. Um, she did not have much sympathy for for <laughs> prostitution. Um, now, in, in, in Wilson Craft's moral theory, modesty is an important virtue in its own right, but it also sort of flavors the other virtues. It softens them, she says. You know, if you think about um, justice, for example, a just person does, you know, what's right in terms of, say, apportioning goods to other people, uh, which means sometimes you got to take stuff away from other people. Now, you can do that in, in a kind of mean way. Or you can do that in a way that shows respect for other people, that doesn't make too much of yourself. Modesty would, would you know, put the gloss on that. Um, courage would be another good one, that modesty can, can alter that way. She says, it's a pale moonbeam that renders more interesting uh, when it softens, giving a mild grandeur to the contracted horizon. And she's a great you know, fiction writer, too, by the way. Um, now, like I put it out before, in other chapters, she's going to forget that she bashed humility and talk about what she's calling here modesty under the word humility, which shows us that maybe what she is talking about is similar to what some other people thought of as, as humility. Maybe she's quite different from David Hume. You know? um, maybe there's a lot of alternative ways of looking at it in, in modern thought. Um, maybe she's more like Aristotle. You know? um, these are all sort of interesting things to, to pursue. But you notice that we've got a lot of different perspectives here on what counts as humility and whether it's a good thing or not. Most of these people do seem to think it's a good thing, but I kind of cherry pick people who do because we're talking about humility. We can find a lot of other people who think humility is a terrible thing. You know, it's, it's going to get in there. It sounds a lot like David Hume. And we can find them at every period in history. We can find them in the medieval period. We can find them in the ancient period saying, look, you're never going to get ahead if you don't put yourself forward. Um, so these are tendencies, I think, that we see popping up in how we, how we understand this. And what theory you have about humility is going to open up the possibilities for being humble or being proud. Um, so I'll, I'll sort of end on that. Um, and you know, we can do some questions or general discussion, whatever you guys want to do. Um, I certainly think we could use a little bit more humility in our um, political system. Oh, yeah. I mean, really, <laughs> we could use a yeah. little bit more of it. And, and more, more willingness to compromise, too. Things are so polarized right now. I mean, that may, those may be connected. Yeah. You know, the thing I was thinking is, on a fundamental level, or just sort of basic human goodness level, I think humility is an important virtue to want to possess. It's yeah. important that you want to possess it. Yeah. But I also think that there's something, and it might be a little bit about what Joan is saying too about the political system. I think humility becomes a very powerful tool for manipulation. Because if you uh, possess a really keen sense of slippage or kind of mimicry, yeah. like you can do a lot of really useful things with the economy of humility. Yeah. Like I could be talking to Vivi and just saying, oh, you know, I feel so compassionate about, like if I know Vivi's like very, you know, focus on animal rights or something, you know, yeah. and I'm talking about, you know, how I try to walk lightly on the earth, and I, you know, I plant forward kind of year. Like, I, I can give yeah, her yeah. a lot of favor by appearing to have a sense of humility about my interaction with whatever it is that she's invested in. And I think that's what we find so insufferable about elections, is I'm just as ordinary as the next guy <laughs> until I'm in this room where I'm talking to my lobbyists, and then I'm really for the rights of the independent corporation to, yeah. you know, do this. And it's what we find so, you know, just sort of distasteful, because it, it, it requires a bi-directional relationship of trust. Yeah. I have to trust that the, the, the humble self that you're presenting to me is, in fact, who you really are, not just your projection of what you think that I'm looking for in terms of humility coming from you, yeah. right? And it, it's just, I, I feel like... Politics, it's, yeah, politics is going to be a bad place to try to find that, at least with <laughs> modern politics, in part because you got to do this mass appeal, but you, at the same time, if you really do come from the mass, 
um, you generally don't make it into politics. We have, we have a we do have an aristocracy uh, of, of wealth and, and uh, class here in, in both parties too, but yeah. equally. And then like with Bush versus Gore, we're um, running against each other. What we had there were, were two political dynasties that had been in politics for, in the case of the Gores, five generations, in the case of Bush, four generations, um, holding power, you know, and, and like moving themselves up. Um, there's a lot of talk about, you know, what if Clinton and Bush run against each other? And then, you know, some people are like, geez, you know, can't you find anyone else? You know, <laughs> so at least we have the pretense that, you know, we're, we're dealing with people who have anything in common with us, you know? Um, and, and so I think, you know, part of what goes on in modern politics is this constant projection of, yeah, I am just like you, you know? Um, I came from Muhammad the beginning. Some, in some cases, it's true, like Bill Clinton. You know, he actually did grow up in a trailer park. Now, he became a Roman scholar, and that tends to, you know, elevate the nose a bit. Um, but it doesn't seem to have made a huge effect. <laughs> um, but that's not the case for most politicians. Local politicians, it's different, right? But a lot of times, they're not rising. Though they're, they're, them, quite often, you can actually approach and get something done, you know, get the pot hole filled in. Yeah. But when we're talking about where you have to buy TV time and go on election stops, um, I think you're right. There's going to be a lot of projection of, of you know, a uh, facade of humility. Well, and when Obama, uh, uh, I mean, he's one of, I don't know many presidents like him who were raised running after chickens in the Philippines. Well, in Indonesia, yeah. 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 The, um, I just I lost it. Um, Chaucer's. Ah. <laughs> yeah. You know, to see the range. Uh, you know how he deals with the with the deadly sins, the seven de deadly sins. Yeah. So wonderful, and how he deals with the false humility uh, over and over again. Yeah. You know, um, the, fact, and the fact that he's got religious guys like fighting with each other. Too. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's just it's just fabulous. Yeah. It's just fabulous. By the way, a plug for you know the anger series that we have the library. We're gonna uh, I think we finish up with Trost. No, we finish up with Don with Dante, I think, but I think the one before that is Trost. You're you know, doing Chaucer next? No, we finish up. We'll finish down. Yeah. Next is uh the Stoics. Uh, so I bet that potatoes will come up in that. Uh, yeah. But going back to the, the politics thing, um, you know, maybe that there's some areas of life where we just, we, where we can't, it's very hard to have real humility and, and succeed. Like, you know, if you're in a monastery, the other monks may still drive you nuts. They certainly, you know, <laughs> look at their stories about them, they, they often did. But it's a, it's a close-knit community, you know, so there's the possibility of like uh, contact. Um, maybe some other communities that's not really a possibility. 